It's the Hero Show. Welcome to the Hero Show, everybody. Starring the imperturbable John Hersey and the irrepressible Andrew Bernstein. I am Andrew Bernstein, and you are indubitably John Hersey. How are you doing this morning, John? Excellent, as always. How are you today, Andy? Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to rock and roll. It's a beautiful, sunny winter day in the in the New York suburbs. And, uh, you know, we got, we have a, a couple of lesser known heroes today, you know, and, that, and that's really good for the hero show. Part of, you know, part of what we do is, uh, you know, uh, we applaud heroes, we, uh, we, we're hero worshipers, and we want to bring the, you know, we want to bring the knowledge of heroes to a general public. And so doing towering heroes, everybody knows of, you know, like uh, George Washington, for example, is, is really good, but some lesser known heroes too, who deserve their, their, their accolades. And so for today, we have the British American scientist, uh, uh, astronomer, astrophysicist, Cecilia Payne, and the American surgeon, uh, Vivian Thomas. So uh, we have two, you know, two uh, re really deserving uh, subjects for the show today, John. Yeah, certainly lesser known. I have to uh, thank you for actually introducing me to these two. Before you uh, suggested this topic, I, I had no idea and I was just blown away by their stories. Yeah, they, these are, these are great stories. I think we should start with uh, they say ladies first, so so I think we should start with Cecilia. Um, but with, 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 there she is, Cecilia Payne. Her her, her dates nineteen hundred to nineteen seventy nine. So she came in with the uh, with the twentieth twentieth century and went on to become you know a leading. Uh, astronomer, astrophysicist. Uh, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll discuss some of her, her theories. But you know, the focus of today's show is uh, social prejudices and how you know, how these two heroes overcame daunting, uh, you know, irrational beliefs in, in their society to to reach a very high level of a, of achievement. So, uh, Cecilia Payne, uh, born in Britain, nineteen hundred. Uh, what do, what do we know about her her early life? Because I know her I know her experience at Cambridge. You know, we'll 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 get to is really is, is important. Anything important? Anything important in her her early life, John? Well, she attended St. Paul's Girls School in London, and Gustav Holst was the music teacher there. I don't know if you you know about him, but he he wrote uh, the orchestral suite, The Planets, and actually uh, he, he tried to get oh, Cecilia Payne to pursue a career in music but she already at that age was very interested in science and as you said she was able to get into cambridge so did she have did she have talent did he detect talent in music you know because uh, she wanted to be a great scientist did did uh, gustav holtz that was that that was his name right Gu gustav holtz yeah. did, did he discern musical ability in in, in the young cecilia Payne? Yeah, he certainly did. Uh, he said a music career would be the, the, the right choice for her, but she uh, she was already very interested in science at a young age. And although I think she enjoyed music, it wasn't her her calling. Right. That, that's that's really interesting at at at, at, at several levels. One. Uh, we're, we're talking about a multi-talented individual. <laughs> you know, talents in both uh, in, in two very diverse fields. You know, uh, music, music, and, and and science, and and of course, too, uh, the independent-mindedness of our young here, our young heroine here, who who knew her own mind and was was not going to be deterred. Uh, by the irrational prejudices that still existed early in the 20th century, that women, you know, that women shouldn't be sci shouldn't go into science or, or mathematics. I think there may be still some people who believe that today, but but 100 years ago, certainly it was it was prevalent. So she knew she wanted to be a a, a scientist. Go, goes to Cambridge University, and it's, that's a that's an interesting story. So an important. So what what happens there? Well, she goes through the entire coursework and uh, falls deeper and deeper in love with astronomy while she's there. She begins uh, studying botany, uh, mathematics, and physics, and uh, attends a lecture by Arthur Eddington. And uh, right. Arthur Eddington had done an experiment on uh, 
the island of Principi to verify Isaac Newton's uh, theory of relativity. I'm sorry, <laughs> Einstein's theory of relativity. And she, that, that was just a, a huge moment for her. She had a, a complete paradigm shift and became very interested in astronomy, completed the coursework. And I believe it was in uh, 1922 or 1923, that time Cambridge did not award degrees to women. So just another instance of this gender uh, inequality that existed at the time. And um, she was, you know, she wasn't able to get her degree. So as you said, she was very independent and she started looking at her other options. Right. Yeah. That, you know, that we should, we should focus on, on, on this for a, a few minutes. I, I mean, she completed all the coursework at a major university and the school wouldn't grant her a degree because of her gender. I mean, I mean, that is just irrational and, you know, and, and, and unjust, but of course it, it didn't stop her as, as we'll see. But the, the, the other important point, yeah, Arthur Eddington uh, was, was a famous astronomer, right? He was, he was up. What, what, what island? What island did he do all that that research on? I think it's the, it was Principi. Principi. Where, where is that? Is that uh, is that in the Indian Ocean or the Pacific? I'm not sure. Do you know where that is? I, I don't know. I'm, I, don't I know. forget. I don't know. Okay, but but okay, I don't remember either. But the interesting thing is, well, it integrates with your know, point we were making when we did the Charles Darwin show that science sometimes takes you to exotic places can be dangerous as we've seen i don't know if it was in 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 this case but he was he was somewhere you know and i think i think Eddington was you know in 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 the ocean off the coast of of, of this island and they were doing uh what, what they were ex examining the eclipse of the sun i think or um to, in, in order, in order to, uh, like, like you said, in, in, order, in order to verify, see if they could verify certain aspect of Einstein's theory of relativity, and I think they were successful. But you can see how, you know, uh, here's the young Cecilia Payne sitting in the audience. You know, listen to this. How you know, she could have a, a how, have an epiphany. You know, you're doing you're doing scientific research. And you're combining it with a certain level of of adventure. You know, for for a, a, a independent soul, and you know, and it's that courageous soul that's willing to, to embrace all, all these different challenges. You can see why why this would be uh, very exciting. And she falls in love with with the field of astronomy and astrophysics, and uh, be, goes on to have a, a brilliant career in the uh, you know in, in in this field. So she can't get a degree from Cambridge. Realizes the only option open to her in in, in Britain is to be a teacher, but she you know she wants more than that. So she crosses the pond, doesn't she? Yeah, she gets land a, of opportunity. an opportunity to go to Harvard, and. Uh, work at the observatory there at, uh, and, and go to school at Radcliffe College. Harold Shapley, I believe, was the name of the, the gent that reached out to her with a fellowship and some, and some money to come over. And she took him up on it. And he also convinced her to write her PhD dissertation. Um, she, so she did end up getting her degree after all. Right. right. She goes to Radcliffe, which was, you know, the woman's division of uh, Harvard University and, you know, get, gets a PhD. And, her, and her, her doctoral dissertation turns out to be I I important because one of the uh, seminal sites, and, this, you know, I got to confess, John, the, the astrophysics here, the, 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 it, goes over, it goes over my head. But, uh, you know, the seminal, one of the seminal insights of, of her career was that the sun, you know, as a, as a star, and stars generally are composed largely of helium and an enormous amount of hydrogen, and and that went against you know the the prevailing scientific uh, theories of the day that uh, which claimed that you know the the, the chemical elements were, the chemical elements were basically uniform throughout the universe, right, and the, that the that the sun would not elementally be different from the earth, but but her her hypothesis, later proven correct, is that hydrogen is 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 the is the by far the leading hydrogen by far and also helium the leading components of of stars, including our our, our sun. So she, she writes an innovative dissertation, and then what happens? Yeah, so you know, there's an adventure. I want to just add to that, amplify that a little bit. So 
Henry Rowland, an American astronomer, had said that the elemental composition of, of Earth is the same as all these other stars. And she, she found that it's true that the sun does have roughly the same amount of carbon and silicon as Earth, but it has about a million times more hydrogen. And so she writes this dissertation, and one of the people reviewing her dissertation is Henry uh, Russell Norris. Sorry, Henry Norris Russell. And he dissuades her from, from uh, putting forth this conclusion in her PhD dissertation with full force, um, which she thought com just completely neutered it. But um, she knew. She knew what the, the facts were. And, and a few years later, Otto Struve, a Russian-American astronomer, came to the same conclusions that she did using entirely different means. And he got a hold of her PhD dissertation and said that it was one of the most, most uh, uh, genius dissertations ever in the, the history of astronomy. Uh, so he, he gave her great plaudits for having come to those conclusions before he did. And he, he derived them by another means, but they, they both came to the conclusion ultimately that uh, hydrogen a bit a million times more prevalent in the sun than it is on earth right right and so so she uh got her phd from radcliffe with you know with this brilliant dissertation i think that was 1925 right and uh yeah uh henry norris russell who, who you who, who you mentioned uh before you know who, who originally disagreed with her and later came later came to uh uh, see the truth on this. So he writes an admiring paper, you, you know, g giving her, her giving her credit. Nevertheless, he was the one who often got who often got the credit for these conclusions, and uh, and, and Spain at first did not did not get the credit that she, that she deserved for for for, uh, for first arriving at these at these conclusions, which uh, is distressing. Yeah, I think Otto Struve is the one who who typically is given this credit, and. Uh... And Russell's not, although he did do some some other uh, groundbreaking work in astronomy, and, and is well known in the field and and widely respected. But um, Cecilia Payne, you know, she she came to this conclusion, and, and Otto Struve, unfortunately, is is typically given credit for it. But even he pushed that credit off and back to her. He was very admiring in, in his publication of his findings. Yeah, well, that that that's that's good. There's 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 honesty, you know. Uh, uh, in some people, there's, there's honesty in, in some in some scientists, and he you know he he told the truth, and I think eventually, you know Cecilia Payne got the credit she deserved for you know for making this this breakthrough identification. But and and we'll see yeah. parallels here with with her and Vivian Thomas as well when we when when we get to, to him on, on these issues. But she uh, had a work at at she she couldn't get. A full professorship back then, uh, you know, be, because of gender. So she had to work at lower paid uh, uh, research jobs. Is, is, isn't that right? Yeah, for for decades, really. Um, she had to take these. Well, didn't have to, but she chose to take these lower paying research jobs because Harvard just at the time did not hire uh, female professors. Um, there was an MD, uh, Alice Hamilton, I believe that was the first to become a, a professor at, at Harvard. But um, eventually, Cecilia Payne became the first to be uh, to be uh, become a professor from the Radcliffe College, from the Women's College, first appointed full prof professor. And not only that, but chair of the astronomy department. So she was vindicated in time, right. but for, for many, many years, she she did have to put up with the, the low pay. And she was able to do that, luckily, her situation uh, was such that she could do that and, and stay on and continue to supervise research and supervise other graduate students. And many of those that she supervised went on to, to make other groundbreaking discoveries in astronomy. So she really helped, and, and not even those that she, she helped directly, but as we'll talk more about, she, she set an example for a whole another right. generation of female scientists. Right. Right now, now, right now, Cecilia Payne married, um, I think, a, a, a Russian scientist, and it's, I, I don't, I don't, I don't know the details of, of the Gapashvik. Uh, there's a good, 
good Russian name. Uh, he was a scientist. Perhaps he had a full time job, which you know, uh, or a professorship with a higher higher salary. He was the right gender for it, right? But they they didn't hire women as professors. Um, so yeah, that 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 would certainly help the financial situation. But still, the injustice, you know, of uh, of being so deserving of the position and and uh, of, you know of a professorship. And not get not gaining one simply on the grounds of of, of gender, you know, on, on these prejudicial grounds that have nothing to do with with your merit, you know, in 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 the field. So yeah, she's working at lower paid research jobs for for many years, but still produced several important books. She wrote several important books in the in in the field. So um, one one of them, the first one was titled "The Stars of High Luminosity." Published in 1930. See, see for, for me, John, I, I, I go to bed, you know, at night. I, I like to read before you. Know, so I'm, I'm reading, you know, James Bond novels. I don't think the stars of high luminosity would be on my reading, like your know, bedtime. It bedtime sounds like reading. a novel title <laughs> to me. Actually, it sounds like a great book. <laughs> She was able to, uh, I think there and throughout her career, she was able to write these books. I think in part, she didn't have the teaching load that she would have had as a professor. So that's there's another nice parallel to talk about with Vivian Thomas. So she was able to write you know, a series of books and her research through, through her research was able to um, determine certain characteristics of the shape of our, of our universe, uh, of our Milky Way galaxy rather, uh, from the uh, luminosity, the, the brightness of stars. And she wrote another book on variable stars and another, another book on variable stars and, and uh, galactic structure. So yep. really interesting yep. stuff. Like variable you said, the stars. science is beyond my pay grade, but. Uh, yeah, yeah. When I say, you know, st the stars of high luminosity wouldn't be bedtime reading for me. I don't mean that as any criticism. It's just, it, 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 it goes over my head. I wouldn't be able, I don't want to be able to understand the astrophysics uh, involved, but you know, the, these are, uh, these are outstanding works by Cecilia. But yeah, Variable Stars was 1938. And then the Variable Stars and Galactic, actually you mentioned was 1954. Uh, so she, yeah, she was, uh, she was an, uh, enormously productive. And I, in, in, in doing all this work, the, the research and, and writing the books and, uh, uh, you know, eventually becoming the first uh, woman professor, like you said, uh, be, to be promoted from at Harvard, to be promoted from within the ranks at, at, at Radcliffe. Uh, in the midst of all that, I think she, didn't she and her husband have several children? Yeah, they did. They had uh, what was it? Two girls. Two. Yeah, I don't remember. I know they. I know they had several several children. So I, you know, uh, you know, <laughs> Cecilia Payne was a story. busy was a busy little bee. You know, being a mom to to multiple more than more than one kid while doing doing all these other th all these other things. But you know, it shows uh, an important heroic point. And that is, you know, the, the the free will. You make the choice. You know, you know, it's it's hard. It's a it's a it's a lot of, lot of work. But you want to have a productive career, and a marriage, and children. There, you know, and there are, there are people who do it. You know, and you know, and put in the time to be a loving mother or father to the to the children while still having a you know a, a productive career in, in in any number of different fields in this case you know a, astrophysics and astronomy so yeah it's all about it, it's all about the will and and i you know i you know as, as a writer john you know i'll have you know people will tell me sometimes you know oh you know i want to i want to be a writer too you know and, and, I, and I say well 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 are you you know what happened and, and he'll say or she'll say well, you know, no, I got, I got married, you know, and we had kids and, and I, you know, and I had all these responsibilities. So I, you know, put that aside and it's okay. You know, I, I hope you're happy in your relationship with your husband and wife and with your children and in, in the, in the career that you hope you're happy and fulfilled. But I, the question I would always have is that, well, if you really, really, really want to be a writer, you, you know, you, you, you make the time granted it's enormously busy to do all the you know to, to do uh, fulfill all those responsibilities effectively um but if you really 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 want to do something you make the time to do it you, you know you even if it's, you're writing the, your first book at three or four o'clock in the morning you know or whatever 
and this is what Cecilia Payne was 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 able to do: overcome these social prejudices, uh, reach great achievements in the field. You know, mar marry the man she loved, have have children. You know be a mother and everything and, and, uh, you know, live and live this, you know, and, and Aristotle's term, you know, this all around fulfilled life, this flourishing life in, in, in different, you know, in, in different arenas, you know, in, in different aspects of life. So it's all about the will, isn't it? You can, you will yourself to do, to do the things that are really important to you. Yeah. I think will is a hugely important factor. And I think also just the, uh, the smarts to, uh, devote your time well, or to, to block your time well, to, to schedule the things that you want, not to just hope that you can fit them in here and there, but to say, okay, this is the time that I have. How do I make the most of it? I know I have to get all this stuff done. I'm going to, I'm going to do that then. And basically what, what, uh, Cal Newport says, give each hour of your day a job so that you know exactly where yeah, you're, that's, what that's, you're trying to accomplish that's, then. That's nicely, nicely put. And, you know, uh, Cecilia Payne's willingness and her ability to do all of, of these things, you know, it reminds us of the great quote from one of our other heroes. Can you repeat that? You broke up. Uh, yeah. So you're paying this and, and, and ability willingness and ability to do all these things it's a quote our other great heroes Ernest Shackleton who famously said obstacles are just you know the great explorer who said obstacles are just things to be overcome and well Cecilia Payne more instant at the obstacle come I overcame to have this you know fulfilled in in marriage and you know her, her career as an astro, uh, uh, you know, a, a researcher and then professor in astrophysics, astronomy, and a, a, who published at least three books that I know of. So, you know, you will it. Yeah, I think she ended up with uh, five total, which is just incredible. It's, you know, I've, I've yet to write one. I know you're several deep, so um, it probably doesn't sound as as insane to you. But then again, given this topic. Um, it's not like the books just uh, are pouring out of you. There's a monumental amount of research that went into each one of these. And she's credited with something like three and a quarter million uh, observations of, <clears throat> of, the, of the stars of the uh, galaxy. One of the funny stories that I think really illustrates her independence and her scientific mindedness not to say uh, yeah, hard headedness, but uh, she, I don't know if you, you came across this, but she decided to do an experiment on the efficacy of prayer. So, and this was oh, yeah, while she yeah, was still in yeah, school. Yeah, yeah. yeah go ahead. <laughs> I love this. Right. She, she divided yeah, her exams story. into two groups and she prayed on the outcomes of those in one of the groups, but not on those in the other. She had a control group to see if, if praying made any difference. And she actually did better on the uh, exams in the control group that she did not pray on. And so later in life, she became an agnostic. But, um, you know, I, I came across a mention of the fact that That's she apparently fun. taught Sunday school at First Unitarian Church in Lexington, Mass, where they lived. So I'm not sure what brought about that decision. But um, some, some uh, really, really interesting story about just her scientific mindedness. I love that. Yeah. Yeah, that is that is a great story, and and I uh, I wonder since God is all knowing, purported to be all knowing, I, I wonder if God saw, saw through this as a scam, you, you know, <laughs> and, and you know, and refused to right. to grant her prayers. But yeah, it's very, it's very, you know, and yeah, and it's it's certainly indicative. You're absolutely right. Her scientific mindedness to to apply scientific method to uh, you know to religious religious beliefs. So, um, and I think, uh, if I remember reading about Cecilia Payne, you know, talking about her, her talent in music, I think she, you know, throughout her life, I think she, she continued to play various instruments, you know, just for, for, for fun and for, and, for, and for recreation, you know, with her, with her family, you know, with her husband and, uh, and children. So, you know, this is an indicative of, uh, it sounds to me like just this, you know, very Aristotelian life is all around you know, fulfillment, this, this flourishing. And um, before we move on, 
to, to the uh, inspiration she provided for other women in the field of science. Were any 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 other things you you that you wanted to add about uh, Cecilia Payne herself, her own her own life and accomplishments, or should we move on? Well, to I mean, the she great spent her entire of- her entire professional career at Harvard. And even after she retired in 1966, she continued to to do editing and research to to uh, edit the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observ- uh, Observatory research uh, and other journals and books for the Harvard Observatory. So it, it's it really is remarkable <clears throat> that she was able to balance so many different interests into this, you know, flourishing overall life. It's just a symphony of a life, so to speak. Symphony, nice playing, playing in the uh, chords, right? Not just in notes, <laughs> uh, but yeah, yeah, yeah. This is, uh, yeah, it's, it's, she's she's an inspiration, you know, w- without a doubt. And she was uh, to to women in the field of science. And one one example that 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 I know of is was the case of Joan Feynman. Now, any, now anybody who knows anything about 20th century American science, the name Feynman comes up, you know, and, you, and, and you're going to, your head perk up. And yes, yes, Joan Feynman was the youngest sister of the great Richard Feynman, who himself, you know, made deser- you know, probably deserves an episode. I, I, I would say certainly deserves an episode, uh, yes. you know, of, 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 yes. the, of the hero show for both his accomplishments in science and just for his, his, his personality, his, you, you know, his uh, uh, audacious outrageous over the top personality right what was he was he was safe cracking when he, when he would crack the safe at the, at the Manhattan project you, you know you, i mean it's unbelievable but anyhow so the young Joan Feynman the they, the family lived in in far rockaway in queens not far from where i grew up in brooklyn as as, as i read the story uh Joan, Fe- Joan Feynman's mother and grandmother tried to talk her out of a, a, a career in science because they said that women's brains can't handle the concepts of science. Right? That that physically, they, a woman's brain can uh, can understand can't function the way to understand the concepts of science. Now, I, what? Now, a family at, from which Richard Feynman comes and a scientist. Uh, first-rate scientist on her own, right? Like Joan Feynman. I'm guessing it must have been, you know, a, a, an educated family. But you know, it was early in the 20th century, still early in the 20th century. So it's these these kind of, and you know, and 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 the Feynman's uh, grandparents, you know, they may well have been old, you know, old country Jews. I don't know. I don't know the uh, you know the history of the of the Feynman family. But if, if I'll put it hypothetically, if they came out of the shtetl, you know, somewhere in 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 Eastern Europe. Then you know there's there was uneducated the, the, that Jewish population tended to be very uneducated, you know, very very oppressed in Eastern Europe. So maybe that accounts for the for this you know, prejudicial belief. Anyhow, uh, so you know, Joan Feynman was uh, inspired. She she was what what was she was reading she was reading she was reading something where uh, Cecilia Payne's name and accomplishments uh, came up. Was well, do you remember do you remember the story? Do you remember the story, Joan? Yeah. I don't remember the details. Vaguely, I, I just know the the high level details that she saw that Payne was credited for this research and writing these books, and realized, wow, women can do science. This is, you know, what my mother and grandmother are telling me is just total unscientific fiction, and uh, so she realized that she Wallace. could do it, and then decided to pursue a career. and And I think this is the case with loads of other female scientists. And it makes one wonder. I wish we could trace this, but to, f- to find out how many of those uh, later involved with the, um, the you know, the, the math and science done for the uh, shuttle missions, you know, our uh, space program, how, how many of those were also uh, inspired by Cecilia Payne? I bet quite a fair number. You, you know, you reminded me... Uh... There was, a, there was a movie several years ago about those those black American women who were uh, you know based on you know in real life I forget the name of the of the movie off offhand but black American women scientists you know they, uh, people didn't uh, believe back then you know circa 1960s you know uh, that black women could do all you know do all this you know heavy heavy duty mathematical calculation you know and such but 
But the movie, the movie showed the, again talk, talk about overcoming social prejudices. You know, the prejudices against both blacks and women, and 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 these women who contributed mightily to you know the work done at NASA, you know, in the early days of the of the U.S. space program. And uh, I, I don't know for sure, but I, I would guess I would guess you're right that they were probably you know as women were probably inspired by by the by the work of Cecilia Payne to to see that. That women can the brains of women can handle the physically handle these concepts of uh, you know physics as you know higher mathematics and you know and and, and such. Uh, I want to go back to Joan Feynman for for a second because at least her her older brother Richard, who is so over the top, you know, it, it, it's so such a nonconformist. That's not is not so if you know anything about his personality. Surprised that he that he you know was not. You know, convinced of, of of that prejudice. And one story I read I read about that was part of her interest in science was piqued when she was a young girl. <laughs> he 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 coaxed her out of bed one night to to it was what was it to see a lunar eclipse? I think that they he, he they they went across you know near where they lived on a golf on a golf course and were able to observe. I think it was a lunar uh, eclipse uh, at night and just and and it just fascinated. Her fascinated her, uh, you know, and aroused her interest in, in science. And, uh, you know, and, and, and then with the inspiration of Cecilia Payne, uh, yeah, she was able to overcome the prejudicial beliefs that her, her fa some of her family members had tried to instill in her. So, so yes, yeah, so you never know, you know, when you, when you a hero or heroine, you, you, when you're a hero or heroine, you never know who's, who you, your story might inspire. People, people, people that you'll never meet. In your life, you know, I mean, you and I, for instance, inspired by Ernest Shackleton, who was who had died decades before, you know, you and I were born. Uh, even for me, you know, a lot older, but but uh, Shackleton was long gone by the time I was born. But his story, the survival story, is so unbelievable that I mean, it really is inspiring about what what obstacles human beings can can overcome. So uh, Cecilia Payne may well go on to inspire. Whole, whole other generations of of, of young women uh, to be scientists, and not just you know. And then there's the other thing, John. There's, I, I, you know, I'm a, I think we're both strongly opposed to this politically correct nonsense, you know, of our day that's so focused on gender and race and and everything. Cecilia Payne could inspire young boys too, you know, overcome these obstacles. You know, there are obstacles in in anybody's path. You know, there, there won't be those social. Well, maybe there are, given the anti the anti male. You know hostility that you see from a lot of a lot of intellectuals today. But you know, you you, you the the people you everybody encounters obstacles, and when, so when you see a hero or heroine overcome these obstacles, you can abstract away from race and gender and say, "Wow, you know, if Cecilia Payne can can overcome these 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 obstacles in her life, well, I got different obstacles, but you know, with the same amount of courage and the same amount of of, of will and and talent, I, I I could I could overcome these obstacles in my life too." So you never know who you inspire. One more word on Cecilia Payne for me. In, in 1977, she was given an award, and there she spoke and said, the reward of the young scientist is the emotional thrill of being the first person in history of the world to see something or understand something. Nothing can compare with that experience. The reward of the old scientist is the sense of having seen a vague sketch grow into a masterly landscape. Just wow. throughout the course of her life, decades and decades of research, she went from, you know, this PhD thesis about the uh, elemental composition of the sun to an idea that really helped shape our view of the entire uh, solar system. Well, you can see why Cecilia Payne belongs on the, the hero show for, you know, it's, it's the combination, right? Such high level achievement in the face of daunting social obstacles that, you know, some, some less, uh, some, some soul not as dedicated to values and not as self-confident as an independent as hers might have, uh, you know, might have succumbed to the social prejudices. Who, who knows, you know, when you, when you put, the, let's put it this way, the more obstacles you put in, in people's path to achievements, Especially when they're irrational ones, but the more obstacles you put in in the path of, of, of people's way to achievement, the more the more people who who are going to succumb. 
you know, so uh, the, the, these prejudices that, you know, that still exist in large parts of the world, you know, that women shouldn't get an education. I mean, the Taliban, I think, are still with us, aren't they, unfortunately, in Afghanistan? And they don't think, they don't think a girl should get much of an education at all. They're, they're, they're known to kill, you know, you murder women for, you know, for, for getting a, an education. And so you, you, you still have this, this prejudice, you know, against uh, educated women. And uh, this is half the human race. Yeah, you know, half the brain power, human race is in, in you know, to, to different degrees is, be, is being held back by, by different kinds of obstacles, including lethal ones, you know, in, 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 in parts of the Arab Islamic world, you know, maybe elsewhere. And so, you know, the, the, you know it's, it's, a, it's a disgrace, I mean, for two, for two reasons. One, you, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're egoists. We want to see people live their own life. You know, an individual, in, your, your life belongs to you, for any, for any of us, either gender, any, you know, race or, you know, nationality, tribe. Uh, if you want to see an individual self-actualize, flourish, and, 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 and have, have joy in life, that's important. And then you know, a, a felicitous secondary consequence is from the self-fulfillment of, of rational self-fulfillment of people, we all benefit. You know, I mean, we, we the human race benefits. We make advances. It, it, it promotes human life on Earth. You know, it, it, the, the advances made in any field. You know, from 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 archaeology, like you know uh, Indiana Jones. You know, from, from archaeology to zoology, from from A to Z. Uh, you know, we make we make the human race makes advances. So these these obstacles are, are you know placed in the path of different different. Uh, individuals for, for, for stupidly prejudicial reasons, you know, the obstacles in the path to their fulfillment and success. First, first foremost, always harms the individual, but it, it harms humanity as, as a whole as well. So I'm re really glad that Cecilia Payne had the, just had the, uh, had the stones, you know, had, you know, had the courage to stand up to this and, and, and say, you know, bleep this. I'm not going to accede to irrational beliefs. I'm going to I'm going to live live my life, you know, in accordance with my values. I'm going to do my own thing, and she did, you know, and, and and it benefits her most of all, but benefits everybody else as well. Um, should we move on to Vivian Thomas? We shall. Vivian Thomas. There he is. Uh there he yes, is. that's an incredible yeah, uh, important 1910 to 1985 1910 to 1985 so so his life as Cecilia Payne is almost an exact overlap you know this is he's he's just 10 he's just 10 years he's 10 years younger and he dies six years after after I don't know if they if they knew each other uh Thomas much of Thomas's career was at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore and uh, uh Cecilia Payne of course was at, at Radcliffe Harvard in the you know in in the in the in the Bo in Boston, uh, Cambridge anyway. So, so I don't know if they knew each other. Probably may, may may have known of each other. But but Vivian Thomas's story also, I mean, just has daunting obstacles that that he overcame, doesn't it? Absolutely. Born you know he was the the grandson of a slave, and born in Louisiana. His parents made their way to Nashville, Tennessee, and uh, very very poor and race relations at this time were uh, just terrible but uh, he, he wasn't he wasn't born into slavery thank god and um you know he took after his father's trade his father was a carpenter he trained as a carpenter but uh he had his eyes from an early age on a medical career and really 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 wanted to go to med school saved for years to go to med school enrolled at uh what is now Tennessee State University, it was then an agricultural college, but had a pre-med program. And then in 1929, the, um, the, the stock market crashed, leading, of course, to the Great Depression, and the bank that Thomas had his money in failed. He lost seven years' worth of savings. And, oh, uh, God, that's you know, horrible. Yeah, so the, the, the dream of pursuing a medical education quickly evaporated. But uh, and, you know, in this right. time, he was able to get an assistantship in a lab and be hired at uh, Vanderbilt University, you know, the, the Harvard of, of the South, as they call it, under uh, a very young yeah. but groundbreaking surgeon, Alfred Blaylock, who we're going to talk a lot about their partnership. Yes. Is, 
a 35 year partnership that led to some incredible medical breakthroughs. Right. Absolutely right. Yeah. And, and Vivian Thomas's autobiography is titled Partners of the Heart, you know, about his, uh, his years uh, working with Alfred Blaylock and the, the, the ambivalent, the ambivalent relationship there, the all, you know, and we're going to criticize Blaylock, uh, for, for some of this, but, but nevertheless, there was a lot of positive, there's a lot of positive things in, in that relationship. And you're right. This is we're, we're so we're in 10, um, Vanderbilt University, so that's Nashville, right? Um, yeah. so we're, we're, we're in Nash, Nashville, Tennessee. This is 1930. So the Jim Crow era is, you know, is still prevalent, you know, uh, you know and sometimes br brutal segregation. You know of, of, of black American citizens uh, in the South. So, so 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 Alfred Blaylock, of course, goes on to you know to be one of the great surgeons in American history. And we give we we'll give Blaylock credit. He he recognized Vivian Thomas's talents very early on. In fact, uh, there was a, there was a movie made about about this. I don't know if you know if 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 you uh, you know all the all the people viewing out in, out in Hero Land. Had a chance uh, uh, to see so something the Lord made with, uh, with Alan movie, Rickman yeah. as, yeah, yeah, it is Alan Rickman as uh, Alfred Blaylock and Mo Steff plays uh, yeah. uh, Vivian Thomas. Now, if I remember correctly, and I think the movie was was accurate, you know, in in, in much of its of of its portrayals. And um, if I remember correctly, it's early in their partnership when when um, Vivian Thomas was such a skilled surgeon. That, that Blaylock, you know, you know, he, he, he's some people that they, they, they have so much aptitude in the field. It's like it's like they're a natural, you know. And, and it sounds it sound like Vivian Thomas was 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 a natural because with very little coaching from from Blaylock, who, you know, who's an accomplished surgeon. Uh, what was it? it was just, uh, that that uh, you know, uh, Alfred Blaylock is looking at some some of the work uh, that that Vivian Thomas did as a surgeon and said it was so beautiful. It looks like it looks like something the Lord made, and so so um, it, re, re, really very early on, Vivian Thomas showed the skills of a highly accomplished surgeon. And so Blaylock yeah, so recognized that. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, it, he, in, like you said, he he showed these skills very very quickly after they met. Uh, the first day they were already doing surgery, and the next he said, you know, show up. Uh, so Blaylock told Thomas, show up early and get us set up for another surgery. And so he's being told to, you know, um, you know, at this time they were doing surgery on dogs and, um, you know, we probably don't want to dwell on the, the graphic nature of that. It's a sad fact that no, it we had don't. to be done that way, but it did. But, um, you know, he had to, him get the surgery up and here's somebody who's coming in, he was a carpenter and he's telling him on day two, get the setup, including doing the calculations to get the anesthesia correct for the, uh, the size of the animal. So uh, very, very quickly they developed this relationship and within a month, Thomas is able to start doing surgery on his own. And he is not only gifted, but absolutely devoted to this field. He stays and reads uh, Laylock's books, and uh, begins taking some home and, and just studying up on medicine, finds others who he can learn from, and just puts everything he has into becoming uh, good at what he does. Right, and you know this 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 reminds me of something, John. This is uh, you know uh, um, I think it's an important point about education, and and really and really highlights you know Vivian Thomas's dedication, but you know there's this. This belief, which you know, I, I think is prejudicial, that you know, in order to have a, a successful career in many fields, including medicine, you need to go to medical school, you know, and you need you you, you need to get a degree from you know Johns Hopkins or Harvard Medical or or, or whatever, and it, and this shows us you know Vivian Thomas, because of financial reasons, like like you mentioned, you know, from the, the depression and bank failures, he didn't have the money to go to medical school, but he found a mentor. You know, you, if you know, if you if you find if you find a mentor who can obviously have one 
certain level of ability. Two, you have a lot of will, a lot of want to, a lot of desire and determination. And three, you, you find a, a mentor. You, know, you could become expert in a field. And I, you know, keep mentioning, I, I keep mentioning, I'm, I'm, I'm a broken record. I know, you know, a, a guy we're good, definitely going to do on the Hero Show in the future, Thomas Edison, who got kicked out of the fourth grade, but show, he, you, you know, he did, the, the headmaster of the school told Mrs. Edison that her son's brain was addled. Um, but he went on, he did okay, didn't he, in, in the field of, of electrical engineering. He never studied, you know, he never had any schooling in the field of, a, of electrical engineering engineering and so this idea that you have to go you know i, I come i come back this idea i i taught you know at a prep school you know, funny it was a prep school but i told the kids all over you don't have to go to college to, to have a successful career you don't have to go to college to get an education you know and it is that uh uh famous line attributed to mark twain somebody else actually said it first um you know that i never let my schooling interfere with my education and the, the, the point here is not to knock schooling. Schooling should enhance one edu one's education. Now, today, this, you know, the schools are so bad that it often doesn't. But it should enhance one's education. But the, the, the hard nugget of truth in that, in that claim is that my schooling or uh, my education or anybody's education is not limited to my schooling. And mentoring is a really, really good way to get an education. Vivian, Tom Vivian Thomas, let's, let's, let's put it this way. Give Blaylock some kudos for rec for recognizing Thomas's talent. I mean, Blaylock was a white Southern man, white Southerner. Prejudices of the day is you know thought you know well blacks can't do this kind of this kind of work. But Blaylock recognized overcame prejudices to that extent. He recognized Thomas's talent, and Thomas had the want to. He had the he had the intellectual ability and the desire to learn from his mentor and become an outstanding standing surgeon and mentoring is a really 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 good way to to, to get an education you don't have to spend two hundred thousand dollars to go to harvard university you know so uh, anyhow so thomas becomes an accomplished surgeon in his, in his own right and they and they go on to various medical innova innovations don't they yeah and, and i want to come back to that education point uh so yeah go ahead uh, thomas thomas would go on to mentor a bunch of other uh uh, black lab technicians, uh, 20 in a 30 year period. And he told one of them, he said that everybody's got a job to do and you've got to do it hundred percent, regardless of your level of education. doesn't matter what kind of education you have, you've got to do the job hundred percent. And he learned that he had, uh, earlier when he was a carpenter, he had, uh, put in a piece of flooring in a building at a job they were working on. And his, his, uh, foreman came down and he said, you've got to redo that. I can see that that's the piece you just put in. And so he did, and he did a very good job. And his foreman later said, yeah, you, you did, but you should have done that the first time. And so he took that lesson with him and he always, he never thereafter had to repeat another project, to be told a second time, you know, this is how you do it. He just yeah, took it to heart. Your education, you can get that while you're, you're learning on the job, but just learn it, learn it right the first time and, and don't continue to make the same mistakes. So yeah, while well, they're still in Tennessee, so um, Thomas and Blaylock spend a decade working together at Vanderbilt and do some really pioneering research on shock. Your body goes into a state of shock whenever you have a serious medical injury and you lose a lot of fluids, you lose, lose a lot of blood, say if you lose a limb or a shot or something. And most people at the time believed that that was caused, the state of shock was caused by toxins entering the blood. and then. Uh, 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 Blaylock understood that th this was a bogus theory and he thought that it was caused by a, a loss of blood and fluids. And so right out of the gate, the, the two start doing these experiments on how to, uh, how to help people that are in medical shock and are able to, um, keep, you know, keep their subjects alive uh, with, uh, IVs and blood. And so right. this technique becomes hugely uh, popular and, and, you know, is deployed in World War II to save thousands and thousands of lives. And Blaylock gets a, a you know, world famous reputation. Of course, his is the only name on the research papers that are being published. Thomas is, is uh, left out of those. Not only is he left out, but... You know, he finds out later that uh, 
he is actually being paid the same as janitors at Vanderbilt. And he's doing this groundbreaking, he's helping with this groundbreaking medical research. And, uh, you know, he's just not, he's not being paid for what he's worth. It's really unjust. Right. But, right. Um, yeah, it's terribly unjust. And there's the parallel with Cecilia Payne, who also, uh, in her case, because agenda in Vivian Thomas's case, uh, because of race, uh, the, these institutions will not grant them the, pos the positions that they so abundantly deserve and the pay scale that goes with the, the, the kind of, you know, high level work, you know, high level intellectual work that, that they're doing. Nevertheless, you know, that, so, so this is, uh, you know, certainly re re real prejudice and uh, unfortunately, uh, even, you know, this kind of prejudice even continuing in, 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 in Blaylock himself, because, you know, Blaylock doesn't lobby uh, arduously with, you know, with the administrations of these institutions, first Vanderbilt and later Johns Hopkins. It's only with, you know, constant prodding, you know, on Thomas's part, who's, who's not getting paid, you know, anywhere near, you know, the, the, the level that he deserves, constant prodding before Blaylock you know, goes to the administration and starts to get a better paying jobs for, for Vivian Thomas. But so that takes years, you know. But uh, uh, also they're doing, they, they, they start doing research on uh, vascular and cardiac surgery, don't they? Which is against the taboos of, of the day that you're not supposed to, you know, do, do surgery on the heart. And, uh, but, but Blaylock and Thomas are, are innovative and, you know, down with the taboos, we're going to, you know, we're going to, to research this field and make it make advances in 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 this field and they do right yeah so in, in uh, 1937 uh blaylock has become a, a household name and at least in the medical communities uh sought after and and henry ford health system in detroit offers him a job as head of surgery there and he says yeah uh I, i'd love to come but one of my conditions is that i have to bring my assistant vivian thomas who now they've been working together seven years and blaylock understands that he's just not uh he's not able to do the kind of work at the level that he's doing it without thomas and henry right. ford has no the only way we'd hire a black person is if he was a janitor and so blaylock turns down the offer and three years later in 1940 johns hopkins his alma mater offers him a, a job as he head of surgery there. And again, he requests that Thomas come and they play ball and uh, they do hire him on. They get there and th neither of them had visited. They had done the negotiations from afar. And it's just the, the situation of Baltimore is bleak because the price of living is so much higher than either expected, so much higher than it was in Nashville. And for Thomas, it's really bad because these, these places far more racist, far more segregated. Um, he is, you know, he first day on the job, he goes to work and is told that he has to use the back entrance. He's not allowed to come in through the front door with Blaylock as they walk into the building. His, it's it's his, unbelievable. Uh, you, you, yeah, go ahead. You would think that Baltimore, you know, Baltimore being, you know, so much further north, you know, and, and, and closer to the, to the north, you'd think if anything, it might be less segregated and less hostile to blacks but the, you're, you're right the exact reverse was true baltimore uh the, you know the city generally and johns hopkins at a major university you know uh, with a major medical school and yet is completely segregated and and, and, all, and all of these irrational prejudicial rules that thomas has to uh has to has to abide by I know he he he. Uh, he I was reading his autobiography of you know a, a few years ago. Your partners uh, partners of the heart, and uh, he's saying he's walking down the hall at Johns Hopkins in his lab coat, you know, and and he says he 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 uh, got hostility from both whites and blacks, you know, whites because they didn't think you know blacks were capable of doing you know laboratory research and blacks because they 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 resented his success you know that they they saw him as as uppity you know and so he he had yeah he's here he is doing this outstanding life-saving work and he's generating hostility from you know from from both whites and blacks at the you know at the at the schools you know this, the, the injustice of that, you know, is just, you know, is just terrible. But 
uh, <laughs> obstacles are just things to be overcome, right? That's the heroic spirit. You know, if we had a big hero building, John, you know, maybe someday the, the objective standards, so we have a hero building, you know, we have, we have grounds and have a hero building and we'll have Shackleton's words, you know, engraved in the stone above the front door. Obstacles are just things to overcome. And Vivian Thomas is a great, is a great illustration of that. He keeps going, doing this groundbreaking work and, you know, you know, laying the foundations for, you know, for, for heart surgery and, and, uh, and then, of course, comes the Blue Baby, the, the famous Blue Baby case. Do uh, you, you, you remember any, any details of, uh, of that? Yeah, Doc, in 43, so you know, three years after they've arrived in Baltimore, uh, Dr. Helen Tosig comes to them, and she's saying that you know, these babies are being born, and they turn blue. Um, it's clear that they're, they're something wrong with their hearts. They're not getting enough ox oxygen. And there's nothing that we can do about it. I mean, if a baby comes out this way, they are just, they're going to die. And like you said, at the time, it was a total, there was a total stigma against doing any sort of operation with a heart. It was thought that as soon as you attempt to operate on the heart, you're going to kill your patient. This is a moving right. mechanism. What are you going to do? I mean, if you stop the heart, how much time do you have before you kill your patient? So right. it was just, right. there was no cardiac surgery at the time. There's, that was not a field. Cardiac surgery was born with Vivian Thomas and Alfred Blaylock and the blue baby syndrome. And I think to, to really understand how they did this, you have to understand something, just the basics of, of the workings of the heart. There are four chambers in the heart, left side and right side. And the right side receives deoxygenated blood from the, from the body, pumps it through the lungs, into the left side, which then pumps that oxygenated blood back out through the body. But the blue babies they, they came to find had a series of problems with their heart. There were four congenital defects with the heart that caused them to, to have this lack of blood or oxygen flow throughout the body. It's a hole between the two sides of the heart so that deoxygenated blood mixed with oxygenated blood. And so what was pumped back out in the, in the body was a mixture and, and not a very good one of uh, deoxygenated blood and, and oxygenated blood. Um, there was also the, the fact that the, uh, the tube, the aorta, uh, was actually basically sucking the deoxygenated blood from the, uh, the right side of the heart, the deoxygenated blood side, and, and pumping that through. So uh, basically, the, these several conditions came together to severely depreciate the amount of oxygen that these babies were able to get throughout their bodies. And they'd, they'd be very, very blue with you know, purple in their nail beds and um, just unable to walk. They would, they would crouch themselves up as to, to get oxygen uh, out of the limbs and, and back into the core of their body. So just really devastating uh, congenital heart defect called the Tetralogy of Fallot. And it, it came to Vivian Thomas to figure out how to deal with this. I mean, he was given some, uh, some guidance by Alfred Blaylock. He, you know, Alfred Blaylock had some ideas and Helen Tosig herself said, you know, there must be something that we can do to, to correct the tubes because it really, you know, several problems with the, just basically the wiring of the heart. And uh, you know, yeah, give, uh, give Helen, give Helen Tosig some credit here. She, she suspected that there was a surgical solution to this, uh, you know, yeah. to this verbal problem, he went to Blaylock, uh, and, and 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 you're right. Vivian Thomas did most of the heavy lifting on on on, on developing this surgical technique, isn't that right? Yeah. Whereas Blaylock was, you know, head of surgery and was being called away to this and that operation, uh, Thomas had the days largely to himself, and he would set up experiments, and he did hundreds of experiments. And you know, this might seem kind of counterintuitive, but in order to to fix this, this problem, they first had to be able to create it in their test subjects. So he had to create this uh, blue baby syndrome in their test subjects and in, in dogs, and then figure out how, what procedure they, they could use to fix it. And so he was successful in both and both took months and months and months. Um, but uh, he was able to do that. And you, you, you could see he pulled all of these different skills together, and integrated this incredible skill set to come in this, insanely good surgeon. I mean, he had started working in carpentry at a very, very young age, dexterous hands, very nimble, 
uh, was able to build his own equipment. There was no equipment for working on hearts at the time. Cardiac surgery wasn't right. a thing, so they didn't have the tools for this. So he was building his own tools. And uh, those tools then became the tools that they would use to, uh, to do this on the first human subject, Eileen Saxon, 18 month year old, uh, 18 month old baby that, that came in that was uh, you know, very close to death. And you know, the, the, the tale of this surgery is just, it's just incredible. Just blows the mind. Uh, Alfred Blaylock doing the surgery, Vivian Thomas there at his elbow on a step stool, looking over his shoulder and coaching him through the whole thing. And of course, you've got these white doctors in the gallery who are, they, they just find this bizarre. You know, not only bizarre, but just yeah. unacceptable. And most of them think, for, yeah. you know, in the first place, you shouldn't be operating on a heart. So to, to do it, to operate on a heart and to be coached through it by a, a black man who wasn't even a doctor, what is, what is going on here? They couldn't, they couldn't. Yeah, that's, it. yeah, that's it. That's incredible. Thomas, Thomas was the expert on, uh, on this. Like you would say, he's the one who should have actually performed the surgery, but he's not allowed to, right? He's, he, he doesn't have an MD. He's, he's black. So yeah, what a, what a, what a confluence of obstacles. You can't operate a heart in the first place. You can't be, you know, have a black man do it or be or be coached, by, you know, by a black man. So uh, Blaylock and Thomas were breaking ground here in a in a in a number of of, of different ways, and they were able to uh, again. Vivian Thomas did most of the heavy lifting here, mostly in, in the innovative groundbreaking work, but they developed the the, the surgical solution. For the for the blue baby syndrome, and they 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 performed it successfully, you know, eventually on a on a number of, on, on a number of, uh, of babies, and they've saved you know their their, their advances. They have saved the saved the, I don't know how many lives you know of, of people who would have died you know uh, as babies you know if 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 it weren't for their for their groundbreaking work, especially uh, Vivian Thomas in this case. So didn't they? They published it in the Journal of, of the uh, American Medical Association, their advances, what, what was that, 1945? Yeah, May 1945. But all the credit went to uh, Helen Tosic and Alfred Blaylock. Vivian Thomas, who did most of the, most of the groundbreaking work, he's not even, he wasn't even mentioned in, the, in, the, in that journal article, was he? Terribly unjust. He got no credit whatsoever. But yet he was, you know, he was here and within the first year, after they had deployed this technique, just at uh, Johns Hopkins alone, they had saved about 200 babies. Uh, so thousands and thousands over the years at various institutions. And this is a surgery that's still done today. It was pioneered by a man, a black man with no medical degree who came up with the, the entire procedure there at Johns Hopkins. There in, in, the, in the laboratory at Johns Hopkins, where he was given dirty looks by his you know, fellow Johns Hopkins employees. And still paid wow. very, very I mean, poorly at this time. Yeah, yeah. We need to savor. We need to savor that this life, you know, this life advancing, you know, groundbreaking, life saving uh, surgical techniques uh, created by uh, a black man who had no medical degree and who was like, like you said, was uh, was you know, was frowned upon or, or, you know, was ostracized by the fellows, you know, other, others at, at Johns Hopkins. And yet he's the one who did most of the groundbreaking work on this, this life-saving surgical technique. Still so poorly paid, you're right, John, that he had a 10 bar, you know, to supplement his income. Uh, you know, so at Johns Hopkins by day, he's training future surgeons. So, some of his students don't want to be like the leading surgeons, you know, in, in American medicine. He's training them by day and by night. It's, in some cases, he's serving them drinks as a bartender, you know, at, at, at one of Blaylock's parties. I, I mean, it's just a bizarre situation. You know, it's so it's so unjust. You know, for uh, Vivian Thomas had a, had a ten had a ten bar, you know, in order to supplement his his income when he's when he's saving the lives of God knows, you know, how many people. The good news here is that his students revered him. You know, and then and they and they they gave him they gave him the you know the, the credit they they respected him looked up to him you know credited him and uh, Thomas started Thomas started to get your know, reputation as a extraordinary surgeon and an extraordinary professor of surgery. 
Denton Cooley, one of his uh, students, one of the, the people who learned surgery from him, he said that even if you'd never seen a surgery before and you watched him do it, you felt like you could do it because he just made it look so easy. And he said that Blaylock was a, a great scientist and a great thinker and a great leader, but he was not a great surgeon. And Vivian Thomas was, was one of the best, perhaps the best of his generation and taught the best of the following generation. Just incredible surgeon. In fact, in uh, 46, he developed a procedure completely on his own. Um, it's called an atrial septectomy and uh, basically another procedure that helps to increase uh, uh, oxygenation. And um, it, he created a surgery entirely on his own. And when Blaylock saw it, Blaylock had been working on this problem for, for several months, couldn't figure it out. Uh, so Thomas waited to show him until the, the, the patient, the test patient was healed and, and showed him the, what had happened. And that's when Thomas, or sorry, yeah, uh, Blaylock said, you know, this looks like something the Lord made. This, uh, this is incredible. Uh, I'm amazed that you've done this. So Blaylock, uh, you know, understood Thomas's greatness and he knew that he couldn't work without him. And again, in 46, Thomas decided that, uh, you know, I, I can't make so little money. My, my family, you know, I've, I've got daughters now and I'd like for them to go to college, even if I can't, um, I need for them to be able to have that opportunity. And so Blaylock again goes to the board of trustees and this time he is very successful. Uh, he comes to Thomas a few days before Christmas and, and says, you know, this is the best I could do. I really hope that you'll take it. And he shows Thomas his, his new pay card and he's doubled his salary. And then from then on, then on out, uh, money was never an issue. And Thomas was able to devote his time to the work that he most loved and that he was certainly uh, one of the best in the field at. Right. It's only in, only in his, his later years... And, and, and subsequent to his death, you know, posthumously, that Thomas gets the full credit that he deserves. His, his former students, commission, you know, a, a painter, and, uh, you know, a paint a beautiful, beautiful portrait of Vivian Thomas. There's a Vivian Thomas building, I think, you know, in, on the campus now in the medical school of uh, Johns Hopkins University. He got an honor. He was awarded an honorary MD, right, from, from the school. So... You know, eventually he started to get the recognition he deserved. And, and like you said, the pay. So, but, you know, first he had to overcome all those obstacles. I mean, it's hard enough to, to be an innovator in any field, you know, and, and, and just come, come up with, with, with new ideas that overturn a social prejudices or, or overturn, you know, conventional ideas. It's hard enough to, to do that work, to be Howard Roth, like, you know, in the Hero of the Fountainhead. Uh, just not just to do the work, but secondly, then you have to overcome you know the conventional theories that dominate you know in in in, in any field during your day. And then on top of that, a third obstacle, you know, a uh, third difficulty for Thomas, he, he had to overcome you know the ra ra racial prejudice. He he had to overcome all of that, but he did just with you know with dogged, as they say, dogged determination. He uh, you know and, and of course a great deal of ability. You know, in, intellectually and for a surgeon, you know, with the dexterity of your hands, uh, and 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 Thomas does to become one of the greatest surgeons in in the history of uh, of American medicine. So I mean, again, this is an inspiring story. I mean, I'm I'm inspired by it. And today, in the Blaylock Building on the campus of Johns Hopkins, there is the portrait of uh, of Vivian Thomas on one side, and across from him, Blaylock on the other, both looking at one another. There's also uh, a portrait of Anna, who was the first dog that Thomas was able to perform the blue baby surgery on and, and that actually lived a full mature life afterward. And it's the only dog whose portrait you can find at Johns Hopkins. Wow. Well, I, you know, what an honor for Anna, you know, and, and uh, uh, but yeah, the the surgical the surgical techniques that Thomas developed there, you know, blue baby syndrome, just a, an extraordinary uh, accomplishment. And so, you know, I would certainly recommend uh, people, you know, to read Partners of the Heart, you know, uh, Thomas's uh, autobiography of his collaboration 
with uh, Alfred Blaylock. See uh, some of the Lord made the good, great, great movie, and just uh, you know learn learn the stories of um, of people of, of of Cecilia Payne and Vivian Thomas and people like them who you know overcame uh, social prejudices along with all the other obstacles that any any you know uh, accomplished person uh, faces to reach you know these very 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 high level accomplishments in in the field of uh, astrophysics astronomy on the one hand and uh, heart surgery and, on, and other surgical techniques on on the other so i mean i i, I mean i'm gonna salute you know uh, both cecilia payne and and vivian thomas and alfred blaylock while we're at it who's more of a mixed case uh but uh well he's great you know blaylock certainly you know a, a great medical man in his own right and uh, didn't give Thomas the credit he deserved. You know, Blaylock never fully overcame his own uh, racial prejudices. You know, you know, white man raised in the South, but he overcame them to a significant degree. You know, and certainly uh, recognized Thomas's talent, mentored him, gave him a gave him the opportunity that Thomas might never uh, otherwise never have had. So we so so Blaylock's a hero here too, even though we can we can justly criticize him for for certain failings, but. Uh, we can, you know, uh, certainly applaud uh, hero worship, Blaylock, and definitely Cecilia Payne and uh, uh, Vivian Thomas were not mixed cases. They're pure, as as far as I can tell, pure cases of of the heroic spirit, John. And uh, uh, you know, and we all just say, you know, you know, just say thank you, you know, you know because we benefit. You know, we you know, we certainly benefit from uh, making groundbreaking advances in heart surgery. You know, we you know, we all we all benefit from. From this, so, so I want to say thank you to these, to these, to these two, to, to these, to these great, great heroes who you know overcame so much to reach uh, achievements that that benefit human life. So you know, we I I think it's just to express gratitude to them. Absolutely, yep. Everybody's got a job to do. You've got to do it one hundred percent, regardless of your education. So go do it. Figure out what it is and go do it. Yeah. Right, and I, and the only thing I would I would want to qualify that with is I would say regardless of your schooling, because your education is much broader you know, than than your, your schooling. And if I remember correctly, uh, Vivian Thomas you know, wanted to go to still still you know in, in middle age wanted to go to medical school, and and uh, what was it Morgan State? It was one of the traditional yeah. you know black schools. That that he he went to, and they wanted him to come in, uh, you know, like as a beginning level student. Whereas he's one of he's one of the great surgeons in the world, you know. And they want him to come in, you know, as a, as a beginner. They wouldn't they wouldn't give him, you know, give him credits, college credits, you know, or, or medical school credits for, for the um, a mass the massive amount of life experience that he had. Yeah, you know, his education. The program. They wanted him to to take a pre med right. uh, bachelor's degree from the beginning. Go, you know, pick your your uh, social science, you know, take your English class. He's saying you're not going to give me any credit for life experience. I'll be fifty by the time I finish this degree. I can't do that. And you know, right. that's one of the things that Laylock never overcame. Is even to the end, he said, you know, I should have should have sent Thomas to med school. I could have done that. Um, but many speculate that even if he had, it's likely that Thomas would not have had the ability to do the kind of work that really he really brought him alive. Um, he would more than likely have, have been able to come become a doctor, but then he'd be, you know, probably a primary care physician in a poor black community, not doing, uh, you know, not training surgeons on the procedures that he developed at one of the most illustrious hospitals in America. Right, I mean the 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 tragic irony, you know, uh, of this. But again, I want to toot the horn here, you know, for you know, for mentoring, education, coextensive with schooling. Uh, a more, much more rational approach would have been to rigorously test Vivian Thomas on his knowledge. I'm sure it would have, he would have exhibited a great deal of knowledge, and then place him within the program. You know where his knowledge, you know that his, that his knowledge merited, because you know he had he did have a very fine education. This from a uh, from a very fine mentor, and so you know anyhow, uh, the 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 bottom line here is uh, thank you to Vivian Thomas for 
see, in developing these techniques that save so many lives and for being an inspiration to us. Again, gratitude to Cecilia Payne for, you know, for her, her advances in astrophysics. You never know when you know, that kind of knowledge is going to become useful. You know, we have real practical you know, use, real cash value, as William James put it, you know, for human space exploration, you know, perhaps, or other, you know, or, or, or other endeavors. And, of course, always the inspirational value of, you know, of, of what she did. And the obstacles she over, overcame. So, uh, I don't. Is, is there any anything else you want to say on these on, about these two heroes, uh, John? Or is that or is that a wrap? Well, I'm just I'm happy to to live in a world in which they bettered. I know that uh, the procedures that Thomas created are, are still in use, and and who knows how many doctors have been trained either directly by him or by somebody who trained under him at this point a, a huge number and, and some of those doctors are heads of surgery at some of the most illustrious medical schools in the country so we all benefit immensely from thomas's work and i think maybe less directly from pain, pains but uh who knows maybe we'll be a multi-planetary species soon and we will get as you said cash value from her uh huge advancements well, in astronomy elon musk says that we will that we're going to be a you know multi-planetary species within the next 30 or 40 years with human beings living on Mars. So, uh, you know, I, I certainly think it will be some someday and, and, and who knows, you know, uh, how much, how much benefit from practical benefit from Ce Cecilia Payne's work will, will add to that. So, you know, I, I, I think that's a wrap, you know, for these two uh, unknown heroes, I hope, or little known heroes. I hope we did a little bit to, to bring the uh, deserved, uh, accolades and attention to you know to the to these two heroes and i'm going to wish you to have a heroic day john and uh, you know inspired by our subjects to, to have a more heroic life you too andy thank you